It is my great pleasure this afternoon to introduce Susan Moffat. Susan is a local art historian and educator. She graduated with degrees from the University of Winnipeg, Manitoba, and the University of London in England. She has worked at the Winnipeg Art Gallery and the Manitoba Museum, and has taught at the School of Art at the University of Manitoba. Her interest in Winnipeg's history and heritage began early with a visit to the Royal Alexandra Hotel and continues today as she is a board member of the Friends of Dalmert Museum. Susan's talk today is, as you can see, before there was eBay, there was eBay. Would you please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Susan Moffat. Thanks very much, Carla. Um, you know, last time we were here talking about a year ago, we talked about some wonderful heritage buildings that no longer exist, sadly, except in our memories and in photographs. Uh, we talked about the Royal Alex Hotel, Eaton's, Moore's, the Town and Country, and the Rancho Don Carlos. Well, today, we are going to have an adventure. We're going to talk about buildings that luckily for us still exist, two of them. One, fortunately, has been repurposed. The auditorium became the archives. And the bay, well, it's still surviving. And hopefully it will for a very, very long time. So let's start the adventure. Let's go back to when it was built. Now, the original retail store actually opened in 1881 on the corner of Maine and York. Uh, it was in competition with Eaton's, who had built their new store in 1905, as you can see. Uh, so in September uh, of 1925, the construction began. It took a thousand workers year-round to actually build the first few stories of the bay, the basement, the mezzanine, and the first three floors. So it was open in the fall, well technically it was November, uh, in 1926. The architect was Ernest Isbell Barrett of Montreal, and he also incidentally designed the very famous Bad Springs Hotel. In this picture you can actually see the construction partially up, so it probably would have been in 1926. Now, I thought numbers were interesting, since we're all, well, we're interested in numbers. Um, 300 men, 120 teams of horses, 20 trucks, two steam shovels, to excavate 150,000 tons of earth to lay the foundation. That's really quite something. 151 concrete pillars were driven by hand down 52 feet into the bedrock. Can you imagine doing that to support the building? So that's what you're walking on when you go into the bay today. Two million feet of lumber, 100,000 tons of concrete, 100, 125 cubic feet of tinder limestone. It became the largest reinforced concrete building in Canada at that time. The area was uh, 560,000 square feet, or six hectares. It was slightly smaller than the bay. The bay was around 800,000 uh, square feet, but then it was eight stories, or the Edens, rather. So this is a postcard uh, from the first early days of the bay. In, in October of 1926, this was in the newspaper, Hudson's Bay, an outstanding achievement made in Manitoba. All the workers were Manitoban. Um, most of what was used as materials was in Manitoba as well, from Manitoba. Um, it was a center point for the Bay at that time, uh, as Winnipeg is the center of Canada, at least geographically speaking. Uh, and so it was quite, quite a feather in their cap to have this store built. The opening took place in November of 1926. Uh, one of the directors of the Bay, 
um, George Galt actually had a, a very fancy ornate key to open what is still the center door of the bay, although we can no longer go into it. The number of staff and the number of people really surprised me. Um, 2,000 staff, 50,000 people that day. Apparently they walked 12 across behind Mr. Galt. Can you imagine? Um, in the bay, so it was very, very packed and very welcomed. And this was, again, only the first three floors that you could visit. Um, apparently they did very well in sales, too. Now the design, and this is where I come in, being an art historian, uh, the design is what is known as a Beaux-Arts style. It borrows from the Greeks, the early Greeks, and the Romans, and the Renaissance. Uh, so it takes bits and pieces and develops it into a, a little more streamlined style. Um, the sort of column-looking features on the bay, uh, these, and they're here, that are still there today, actually, uh, they're called pilasters, and they derive from the beautiful Greek columns from Greece, Corinthian columns, and they're still there. Um, anyway, the doors that you go through in the bay are still there as well, except that the wooden parts of them uh, are not, they're glass. Uh, the wooden parts were framed by bronze, um, and the windows were as well. Now those are still visible in the bay today. Uh, the wood, which had been sort of a teak or a walnut in the doors, sadly is no longer there. And what really surprised me, a friend and I were discussing this, and uh, he said, really, there was an arcade? And I said, well, it appears so. Um, we think of arcades as being perhaps outside, uh, but in European countries, they are also inside. Um, there's no remnants, really, of an arcade in the bay, but there was as soon as you entered either of the side doors, that's the one on Memorial or Vaughan and Portage, there was an arcade in between the two, which really surprised me. Now, it only lasted for about 10 years, but it was apparently absolutely quite beautiful. The interior of the main floor featured 70 what we call Doric columns, and they're still, well, sort of there today. Uh, very, very large, very high ceilings. Let's look at the arcade. Well. You entered it from the same main doors. These are the doors today that are still bronze but glass. Uh, these are the windows. Oops. Now, the arcade. It was made, it was made of travertine marble, which must have been very beautiful. And it was just, as I said, between the two entrances. The display windows there, were, they were very large, they were paned, and you could actually see through them uh, right to the arcade. So as you walk down the arcade, you could see through the Portage Avenue on one side. Now on the south side, it had smaller show windows uh, and also the entrances to the main store. In the arcade itself, it was a cold, which means kind of a curved ceiling and beautiful light fixtures. In 1937, it was unfortunately removed, but uh, they wanted more real retail space. And this is what it looked like. So you can see that the entrance is over here. So you can see the coves here. This is the larger window, so that would be um, looking out to Portage. And this is the smaller window, so that would be actually looking into the base door. That surprised the heck out of me, because most of us are just familiar with walking in the doors, walking in the bronze doors, then going for the aluminum doors, uh, or steel doors, and then you're in the main store, right? So, um, and of course they've done a little bit of drop ceiling now where the um, actual display areas were. So if you go in there, that's exactly where the arcade was, but it must have been incredibly beautiful. Uh, apparently, uh, there were loiterers in the arcade. That was another reason, so they, uh, they were concerned about the safety as well, but uh, the retail uh, was uppermost in their minds. So, uh, absolutely incredibly beautiful. I would have liked to have been there. So, this is where it is today. 
Um, so this is the area where the arcade would have been between the columns and the main windows. Uh, the main window frames, incidentally, are still there, and they're quite beautiful. Um, well, in 1930, this phot photograph was taken of the bay, and of course they were developing Memorial Boulevard at the time, uh, because the bay was one of the cornerstones of what would become Memorial Boulevard. Uh, on the right, you see the bay and the future parquet. This is where the auditorium archives would be. And of course, the triangular piece, I think we're familiar with it, would become the Winnipeg Art Gallery. This building, ironically, is still there. It was a business college. It became the Abbott Building, and I think that's what it is today. This is St. Mary in St. Avenue. So it's a beautiful picture of the development of what would become Memorial Boulevard. And of course, the legislative building was already there at the other end. This is the side of the bay. Um, and you can see actually what was outside. It was not the overhang we have today. It was just canopies. Uh, and that was across the front as well. Um, you can see the lovely, again, the style, the very clean style of Mozart building. And that's a clearer picture of what you would see in the 30s of the bay. So you walk through that door, and you hung the left, or the center door, excuse me, the center door. And you notice today, I was, I was looking around there yesterday, and apparently above the center door here, there's a, a curved window. Today it's actually covered over by the insignia of the bay, of the bay for both. But you see the lovely, the lovely pilasters with the beautiful columns. And then this is, of course, the sixth floor, uh, where originally there would have been first storage. Now, in 1954, um, a canopy was put up, um, which they felt protected people from the rain, well, sort of. Uh, it was 10 feet wide. and. Um, it was restored again in 2001, 2002. So this is the building that we're familiar with. Um, it's a beautiful shot of it. Um, and this is the canopy as it was yesterday. So you can see. And this is what it would look like the bay in the 1940s. Christmas is a very busy period for it. The main floor practically packed. Um, down here, uh, you have the elevators, at which time there were two banks of elevators. We're going to talk about those in a few minutes. Wonderful bay clock. And the Doric pillars. And uncharacteristically, it's not so crowded. It was a blizzard in 1966. Um, so very, very, and this is still the main floor. At this point, there were accessories on the main floor. And way down, again, um, are the elevators. Now let's talk about the elevators. There were two banks of them, six on each side almost in a curved form, facing each other. Um, one side was up, the other side was down. Um, the picture that you see uh, was taken shortly after the bay opened uh, on the third floor. Now, the second bank of elevators was removed in 47, 48 to make room for the escalators because they were going to use escalators as an additional uh, people mover uh, and they needed the room to go right up to the fifth floor. Most of us remember the lobby murals, right? Or at least one of them from the bay. Well, there was a second. Uh, the lobby murals were created by a Canadian architect who was very well known at that time, Adam Sheriff Scott. Um, Edward Tappan Olney. Now, Adam Sheriff Scott also did the bay calendar that was out for many, many years. He did the paintings on that, and he also did the paintings for the Bay Magazine, which was called The Beaver at that time. So it was fairly well known. 
let's have a look at renewables. Now most of us are familiar with this one. We've, we've seen it up until well, the past few years. It's actually called the Pioneer. Now the Pioneer at Fort Gary in 1861. The other one which most of us have not seen was called the Nonsuch, uh, which makes sense because the Nonsuch sailed into Hudson's Bay. Um, the Pioneer was removed in 2014 very carefully and is now at the Manitoba Museum. The non-such mural was removed in 1948 in three pieces, sent to Toronto and only partially survives. They tried to conserve it at that point, but it isn't in that great condition. But it is also in storage at the Manitoba Museum. So let's have a look at the one that remains. So this is the one that is in fairly bad condition. This is the only shot we have of it. Uh, only it's a partial shot of the mural. Um, it's absolutely quite beautiful. Um, the non-such, the non which is uh, a replica, of course, um, of one that is at the Manitoba Museum. And you have an Indian encampment on the right, and the Courier de Bois on the left bringing their canoes in. Um, courtesy of a friend of mine. Uh, this is when the Pioneer mural was brought into the Manitoba Museum and laid out in one of the galleries um, as it had to be cleaned and photographed. It'll give you an idea from the lady at the end how large that mural actually is. Um, it was removed in fairly good condition. Um, beautiful colors after it was restored uh, and these pictures are courtesy of the Manitoba Museum. Uh, what I've done is I've put the whole mural on top and so we can see each part of the Pioneer mural in thirds. Uh, in the background uh, is Upper Fort Gary. So while we have the wonderful Upper Fort Gary gate close to the forks, this is actually um, his interpretation of what it would have looked like at that time. And you see the famous Hudson's Bay point blanket with the be oh, beautiful teepees, tents. Now each of these um, pieces that are missing, uh, that's where the elevators were. There we are. So there is the Fort Gary gate that we now have and the rest of Upper Fort Gary. So this does present a version of history of that time, at least certainly a history of the Hudson's Bay at that time from their interpretation. If you can imagine the time it took to paint that mural, it is on canvas and then applied to the wall. So it's 54 feet by 10 feet. That's one of them. The other one would have been the same size. The fact that it's not flaking, that the colors are still brilliant, is quite something because it stood there for, from 1927 to 2014. And the Pioneer was actually a ship on the river. So it delivered uh, goods. And you can see the detail of it here. The Curie du Bois. It's, a, it's an absolutely beautiful mural when you see it very close up. And of course, most of us would have seen it from the ground level looking up about 10 or 15 feet. Now the bay had many amenities. I haven't mentioned them all in this slide. Uh, beauty parlor, telephones, library, post office. Surprised me again, an auditorium. It also had a lounge. Um, and. Uh, it also, of course, many people are familiar with the Celebrity Box Office, which was on the mezzanine floor, uh, which serviced the auditorium. In 1930, this also surprised me, it had a navigation beacon. Uh, March the 3rd, and it was lit, and it was for the inaugural mail flight between here and Calgary, which actually also surprised me. And can you imagine, it was lit uh, by the acting mayor on top of the base door as a plane flew over. 
So that was quite a special event for the Bay. Now eventually they would have the Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, they also had, and I remember this, a collection of Inuit art uh, and almost anything that you wanted. So this is the poster, or rather a facsimile of the poster about the inaugural mail flight. It was, very ro it was a very romantic poster. Um, you had the light here, the airplane flying over, and the top of the base door here. And now, so what can we find in the bay? I loved looking through the ads of the bay and the free press and um, from 1926 and 27, and uh, some of the ads since. It was absolutely wonderful to see how everything was described and what the prices are. So, this came from April 27th, 1932, and you were supposed to read the ads from cover to cover, encouraging you to buy, of course. And in the 30s, that would be also very difficult. So, fancy cheeses. And this lady in a very beautiful coat, hopefully from the bay, um, would buy her cheeses in the basement. Uh, the cheeses actually had their own cold storage, which was very, very interesting. You could also get cottons, eyeglasses, rain boots. I love this. Rain boots, and they were $3.99. Um, tiki tic tac prints, 59 cents a yard. And your glasses, wow, $3.75. But then we have to think about the prices, prices at that time. And I love this picture the mod fashions in the 1960s. It was very, very interesting because, of course, these were, this was the era, of course, of the Beatles and the Stones and other British bands. But you also have the nuns and their habits. So it was rather, whoever took it, I actually salute them. So it's, it was just an interesting two different peoples um, with the very, very short dresses and then the very, very formal and custom-made habits. And because we were talking about the ladies, I felt I had to be fair to the men and show them the Hudson room on the main floor, uh, which was where the well-dressed man went in those days. Um, and his accessories were next door. So, what could you get at the bay that we can still get? The Hudson's Bay, the point blankets, beauty in a blanket, made in England, mild deal here, perfect for your gifts, and they still are perfect for gifts, and of course they've been turned into coats, jackets, and everything else, and still incredibly warm. As I said, I love the ads because the descriptions are quite something. Now this is from 1961, and of course the Hudson's Bay was long known for furs, and buy your mink, and this was 1961, but it not, you not only gave money to buy your mink coat, but you also gave money to put it in their fur storage. Handbags, which were absolutely perfect, um, dip, they called them diplomatic carriers. Um, they were perfect, apparently, because they were made in England. Well, not questionable. Um, direct from England. Uh, satchel was $25. And of course, you would travel. Who wouldn't? Uh, you would travel with the right kind of molded luggage. The base still sells it, of course, today. Uh, but this was an ad from 1961. And of course, many ladies' favorite place in the bay, the mirror room. And you would make an entrance. Um, and that was in 1961. For elegance and sophistication, gentlemen, the continental. And apparently it was for the very suave man. So, um, I said, the word usage is wonderful. The pictures are wonderful. 
and of course it was at the Hudson Room. And along or with your suit, you would have to have a, dec a decent pair of cufflinks and tie pins, and again also purchasable at the bay on the main floor. Ties for the adventurous, for a man who knows or has flair for the unique, which is in one of the ads, and they certainly are. Uh, and a Christian Dior, incidentally, tie at that point was ten dollars. But again, we're talking 1962. And at that time, smoking was also very popular, particularly you had to have the right pipe. Sherlock Holmes would have been pleased. And today, and also sporting goods, and they still sell sporting goods, and I chose this one because we were in the midst of, of at the Olympics and go Canada with the skating team. Um, so the bay, uh, you could buy your skates there as well. So you literally could buy anything. And of course, because you didn't want to please your children, Toy Town. You could buy dollies. You could buy bikes for the boys or baseball bats. Toy Town is finally open, a wonderful fairyland. And at Christmas, it took on a very special effect. And yes, electronics were very big as well. Um, TVs. And this is the third floor in the 30s. Um, the tubes for your um, radios. And a beautiful Brunswick model. Wow, gramophone. Only 49.50. And another one for $75. Oh yes, and on the left, a sleeping bag for the man who is a camper. Oh, and you have to have this range. It only takes eight minutes to boil. <laughs> and when the auditorium opened, there was an auditorium day at the bay. And so you have both the auditorium and the bay. Suede gloves, $1.98. Wow, and winter coats. The staff also had their perks. They had their lounge. They had their own. A medical person, they also had their own cafeteria, well, a small coffee shop, actually. So this is where it was in about the 1950s. Uh, and now we get to everybody's favorite, the restaurants. And we all remember some of them anyway. There's what, excuse me, this was an ad, um, bring your family to lunch or dinner. So the Jolly Canuck, the Paddle Wheel, the Georgian Room. I love the one on the right, and it isn't because I'm Scottish. Well, maybe. Robbie Burns, January 14th, 1966. I love it because of the menus. All three of them feature haggis, neeps, spotted dick, which is a pudding. But the Georgian room features something that I'm not quite sure is totally Scottish, and that's a haggis omelet. <laughs> With coleslaw and french fries, I mean, how much more Scottish can you get? Um, so you can see it at the bottom here. But they also, in their, in their fence, they also had scotch broth, so, you know. And you could buy haggis for a, a dollar a pound, if anyone is interested. Um, so anyway, I had quite a laugh over that one. The Jolly Canuck actually started out in the basement as the snack corner, so this is an original. Uh, picture from when it first opened, later became the Jolly Canuck in the 1940, the Georgian Room. Now, the Georgian Room was originally, and I didn't know this, on the fourth floor and eventually moved to the fifth floor of the bay, but it was a very elegant setting for a meal if you were having a special event or just a special time with, with someone else. Uh, originally, it started off with table service, but originally, it, but then it ended up with a buffet service. Um, full roast beef dinners, of course, with Yorkshire Hood, uh, as well as the salads and the sandwiches. Apparently, a very nice cheesecake, although maybe couldn't compete with the town and country in my estimate, but never mind. Um, it opened in 1926, 
and its final name, the George Room, was given in 1938. And so here is an original picture of, of how it was set up originally. Uh, very elegant paneled walls. I seem to remember a fireplace um, and a picture above it, although I was only there once or twice. Um, so very elegant setting at that particular time. However, we all remember, or most of us do, the pad wheel. Until 1953, the sixth floor was actually used for storage of furs and finally opened up in 1954 with the, what would become the iconic paddle wheel uh, buffet and restaurant. So this is opening day, um, October 29th, 1954. And this is closing day. Okay, same. And closing day, sadly. I love the ads for the paddle wheel. Recreating, this is taken from one of their ads, recreating the romantic setting of the era of the paddle wheel steamer. And supposedly it did. The ad that I particularly like in many ways is the ad for the second anniversary. You can dine at the snack counter, or ladies, ladies only, could dine at the Crinoline Court. It's a wonderful place to meet your lady friends. Okay, the gentleman's saloon. No women allowed, except on Saturdays and Friday evenings. Um, good food, a quiet masculine atmosphere for coffee, kind of conferences, lunch. It was supposed to be like the captain's table. And then you had the general dining area. And these are beautiful drawings of it when it opened. I was discussing with someone yesterday how when it was finally opened to women and we, the new closest we could figure out was the late 60s, early 70s that you could actually go into, that you could, a lady could actually go into what was the gentleman's saloon. I think I saw it once. Um, so again, this is the opening period of time. Uh, this is the general period, the general area where you would eat. Oh yeah, that little girl's very happy. Um, the wonderful paddle wheel, but you can see the design of the perimeter buildings, so it's meant to give that atmosphere of supposedly relaxation, but not necessarily. And the last day. Well, here's the Crinoline Court in the 1950s. Yes, the styles are interesting. And a beautiful mural. The murals were created by Alf Wright, um, who worked for the Bay. You can see some fake hollyhocks here, some trees, a fake tree at that moment. And again, the last day of the Bay paddle wheel. Okay, so here's the infamous gentleman's saloon. Um, and here is the outside of it here and here. And you can see just a little bit of the mural that, uh, and here's the last day for a little girl and her mom. And the last lunch, there was actually a mural here of the river and the paddle wheel. Um, I love this shot. Throwing pennies in. Well, at least I did once or twice as a child. One of the big events at the paddle wheel was Christmas with Santa. Uh, the last one uh, was held in 2010. A doors open last year, Heritage Winnipeg um, had apparently 1,800 visitors to the paddle wheel. So that's quite wonderful. Um, and um, Heritage Winnipeg, actually, for those of you who are interested, actually has a subcommittee who's looking into the bay. 
if you're wondering what's happening with the bay. Now the bay also had a parkade, which was actually the first in the city. It opened 1954, October 29th, and this is the opening with five of the oldest employees of the bay driving an incredibly beautiful car up the first ramp. And the bay would do another level the following year and the final one in 1964. Now Eaton's would open up their parkade, their eight level bar parkade in 1956, but the bay was the first. And this is an ad, well of course, I direct my friends to the Bay Parkade. <laughs> Naturally. And so this is how it looked at that period of time, and how it looks a few years later. Now today, in 1986-87, there were renovations done to the first three floors at the cost $4 million. And the fourth cost 700,000, and the sixth 200,000. Now, sadly, today the bay only operates on the first two floors. Uh, the fourth floor has um, a health clinic uh, on it, uh, plus the washrooms, but the rest is, for the most part, empty. Okay. However, the year before the auditorium was built, they actually had a showing of a model of the future auditorium now archives in the bay. So that connects the build, that connects the two buildings. This is a cover from the opening day brochure, the Winnipeg Auditorium in the heart of Winnipeg, the center of Canada, dedicated to the West. This was a drawing, uh, the design of the auditorium that was put out uh, early in the year on the front page of the Free Press. So this is what the front was supposed to look like. <coughs> now the beginnings. Now remember the 1930s. The 1930s was the Depression um, and a lot of people were out of work. It was a make-work project, as I've said here. 18,750 man days of work was divided amongst laborers so that everyone could have at least a little bit of money to go on. Um, men worked for two consecutive uh, weeks and then were replaced by others. And there was a waiting list. It was opened by Prime Minister Bennett in 1932. Now, let's look at the picture. You can see the horses, and this is the foundation work going on. Yes, there were houses on the street that were taken down uh, on that area, as well as a very large house, very beautiful house uh, for the Winnipeg Auditorium. So that's the excavation site. Now, getting into my uh, uh, area, I'm not that old. Um, at least I don't think so. Um, the Art Deco style. Now the auditorium was actually um, constructed in this very elegant architectural style uh, of the 20s and the 30s. It had a vertical emphasis, a little bit of curvilinear and geometric lines, but a little more stylized. Uh, it was made of um, sort of a blue-gray Tyndall stone. It was also the decorative elements, instead of being carved on site, they were actually precast. Um, flat roof, beautiful arch windows that we can still see today, and some wonderful oh, art deco lamps, light fixtures. The architects were George Northwood, Cyril Chivers, Ralph Papp, Donald Ross, and John Simmons. The cost of the building in 1932 was $1 million. And this was taken a few weeks ago, so you can see the sidelines of the buildings today. You can still see these beautiful, beautiful windows down each side 
on the main floors. The upper floors have the rectangular, and you have just this beautiful arch in, in um, Tyndall stone as well. Now here are two of the precast uh, decorative elements. The one on the left, which is repeated around the building, uh, is a lady carrying um, the Horn of Plenty. And in the middle uh, is the emblem of Manitoba with doves holding all the branches above it. The tops of the entrances, the well, sort of columns to the entrances, um, have what we call ionic features, but also cobs of corn. So it's very, very decorative, but again, it was a precast element as well. Things you notice when you're not running around, right? Um, commerce and industry and prudence. This was the city of Winnipeg coat of arms. We have the lady with the horn of plenty here. Here um, it said the Winnipeg Auditorium, but it's been covered over. And on the other side, there is an Aboriginal hunter. Uh, and again, the city of Winnipeg coat of arms. So these are still there today. And I drew over these lamps. I really do. They've been um, res refurbished in 2002, and they are the originals. This was the brochure in the Winnipeg Free Press the day uh, that the auditorium opened. <coughs> Winnipeg Auditorium, October 19th, 1932. So this was the cover. It was rather a colorful cover. And this is actually quite beautiful, particularly if you look down the side. More history in the making in the inside. So you have the Upper Fort Gary Gate. Uh, you have some of the other beautiful buildings. You have, of course, the wonderful Fort Gary Hotel. You have the bay, and then you have the auditorium. So that's actually beautifully designed. I love the design on it. OK, now this is fun. What happened? Well, the first event was actually an industrial exhibition where anything and everything was shown, and you had a ball afterwards. Um, but anything and everything included electrical appliances and a giant package of soap sets, so, uh, which would clean anything and everything. And these were some of the ads that were in that brochure. And of course, the beautiful cars of that period. Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick, LaSalle, Cadillac, Chevrolet, and also Mercedes-Benz. As an old you please buy me. But it also had the fights. And one of the first other smaller events was the Canadian Championship fight. 43 rounds, I don't know who won. 43 rounds. <laughs> yeah, isn't that something? <laughs> Yeah, on the same day and on the same page, and this is what I found really ironic, it was announced in the free press that Lady Tupper would direct the first production of the auditor in the auditorium, it was Peter Pan, and it was right below the announcement for the fight. Okay, no comment on that. Now, it was a multi-purpose building, of course. It housed not only a concert hall, but also an auditorium which shared the same stage. The concert hall was for smaller concerts, 800. The auditorium held over 4,000 seats. Wow. And as some of you may know, it was the original home of the Winnipeg Art Gallery, the Manitoba Museum, and the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra. Its main floor was also used for conventions, such as the very successful election campaign of John Diefenbaker in 58, and the creation also of the NDP party a few months later. And there was also a liberal rally during the same year. So that was a busy year for the auditorium. Now this is the original photographic shot to advertise the future Winnipeg Art Gallery. You can see the lines, and this is what actually went in the brochure. One of the lectures in the auditorium, and it would have been the um, concert hall part of it, uh, was by a, a modern sculptor uh, called Alexander Arkhipenko, whom the then gallery director, Dr. Ferdinand Eckert, knew. 
and this was his ad for the lecture in January 14th to 28th, 1962, and there's a picture of them, Alexander Archipenko, Dr. Eckhart, and Alexander's wife. And eventually the gallery would acquire, um, through Dr. Eckhart's efforts, this sculpture, The Boxers, and it's now up in the art gallery as we speak. The future Manitoba Museum also was here, um, and you can see some of the cases. It's mainly botany at this time because we can see um, butterflies and there are insects down here. Um, I particularly recall this. Uh, I also recall some of you may or may not. I don't know whether it was on the main floor. I was very young, but some very dusty and grimy stuffed buffaloes. Um, at least I thought so at the time, and I wasn't a diplomat at that point. Um, this is the stage, and this totally fascinates me, because here you have the concert hall on this side, and here you have the larger auditorium on that side. Isn't that fascinating? So they shared the stage, and that, that really makes sense, because you could close the curtains on either side. The auditorium, 4,000, I mean, our concert hall only seats about, what, 1,500, I think? So, um, quite incredible. Apparently the acoustics were quite good at the time. Now, you entered for the auditorium, you actually entered through the main entrance, but for the concert hall you entered the entrance that is now on York Avenue. So here's the main body of the auditorium with the cantilevered uh, balconies. But you can see the number of seats quite incredible. They were all wooden, incidentally. Um, so the acoustics were quite good. There was a lot of musical performances here. Uh, one of the main ones was held in 1932. Uh, this is a picture from it. Lawrence Tibbet, who was a bass baritone from the Metropolitan Opera, uh, and his accompanist came to the auditorium. Apparently it was a, was a full house. His prime role was in Pagliacci, the clown. Um, and apparently he had a beautiful voice that were ready to use. Um, and there are people, as you can see, sitting on the other side. So both the auditorium and the concert hall were used at this performance. And there he is there. Let's look at some of the people that were actually there over the years. The beautiful and wonderful Marian Anderson, who was also a civil rights campaigner, beautiful voice, Yehudi Menuhin, who played there twice, incidentally, once in the 30s and once later. Um, and this was in the 60s as a program from the 1960s. Uh, he played works by Brahms and Paganini, very difficult pieces. The wonderful Arthur Rubenstein, if anybody's interested, I have the program. Um, he played here in 1944 and a drawing by Picasso later. Paul Robeson, who actually stayed at the Royal Alec Hotel, but had to enter from the delivery entrance, um, which is very sad. But again, he was very much an activist at that time. Uh, 19, he played for a number of days at the auditorium, again, to sold out crowds. Beautiful voice. He was the originator of Old Man River, incidentally but also Otello. Omar Sharif, yes, I was there. Uh, in 1970, had a thing about Dr. Zhivago, but so did my mother, so I was heavily influenced. He played a wonderful thing of bridge, but I think most people there for other, were there for other reasons. Um, Susan? Yeah? Uh, that shocked me. What? Uh, the what? fact that the, there was such rampant and over racism yes. in women. There was. I, I talked, when I did the lecture last year, I talked to a man who had waited on him, um, waited on him at that point, and even though he was not in the most formal of dining rooms, they had to put him back at the dining room, and the man who waited on him didn't like that either. But there was, unfortunately, at that time. And, I mean, here was a man who has been on the stages both as a singer and as an actor who's world renowned and because of his race he's not admitted. 
it was very, very sad. And this is what the waiter said at the time. And, uh, just incredible. You know, he didn't, and he didn't, wasn't even, even, you know, he stayed there, but I have no idea what his accommodations were like. But uh, the racism was, sadly, even here. It is. And Margot Fontaine, um, I wasn't around, but she's certainly one of the great ladies of ballet. Um, and, but she was supporting the guides here. Um, and she did uh, The Dying Swan, I hear from Swan Lake. But an incredible, incredible dancer along with Nerea. Now, Glenn Gould. Had, had to reschedule his concert, so uh, the front piece of this uh, is not the right date, so he rescheduled it three months later. Uh, apparently wonderful. Um, he played from Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, and I can't remember the other, and Prokofiev. Um, difficult person um, who saw it, uh, my parents saw it, Difficult to watch him play, but incredibly, incredibly talented. Yay. <laughs> the downtown girl plays downtown. Uh, yes, she was here. Um, and a great, very much a fun part of the 1960s, early 70s. Is she still alive? She's very much still alive, yes. Uh, where is she? Is she still, is she still retired? Nope, apparently not. Still performing. She is, thank you very much. She's in her 80s. She is, and she doesn't look like it, though. <laughs> still performing, still doing some of the same songs. Well, she started off as a child performer. Oh. Yeah, no, she's still alive, very much so. And the wonderful Claudio Arroyo from Chile um, for the symphony orchestra. This is the program. I thought I'd just bring it. Very colorful programs, incidentally. Um, wonderful pianist. This is what he played. Beethoven primarily, again a very difficult piece. Um, they were very, apparently the acoustics were very, very good. He was certainly one of the major pianists of that period. And of course, nobody can forget Leonard Bernstein. Um, he brought the New York Philharmonic here. And um, piano was from Eaton's incidentally. And the program, I have the program at home, um, pages and pages. He had a very long performance, and this is just part of it. Uh, his Candide that he wrote, and he also played a, one of Ravel's pieces, which apparently was beautiful. He was a magnificent performer. He put a lot of emotion into his, into his performances and certainly into his orchestra. A lot of his West Side Story. They seem to have a lot of, of pianists at the time. Van Cliburn, again, um, in 64, who also played Brahms, Chopin, and Beethoven. And again, a magnificent, sorry, I'm going away from the mic, uh, one. This is a poster from Marine Forrester, our own Canadian contralto. Again, a very dramatic on stage at the Met and any other um, hall that she was at. And uh, she uh, did works to Mahler and Purcell. Again, another performer from the Met, uh, the mezzo-soprano Risa Stevens, whose major contribution was her performances of Carmen. And she sang a lot of the works from Carmen and others at the time. The wonderful Rosalind Turek, who appeared in Winnipeg twice, um, once in uh, the 64, this is the program from 64, 65. Um, fortunately, we had it at home when I was able to see her in 1989 um, at one of the local churches and was able to get the autograph. Uh, she's both a pianist and a harpsichordist and she was performing then at age 80 something. Incredible, her touch was incredible. And the harpsichord is a very, hard instrument to play, because it can be very finicky. So thank you, Rosalind, and she's gone now, though. And of course, the wonderful Gilbert and Sullivan, Doyle Card Opera Company, who performed four of their operas, or operettas. And 
the National Band of New Zealand along with the Maori dancers. And of course, the wonderful Danny Kaye, and if anybody's interested, yes, I have the program. He was here with the Gadna, yeah, the uh, Israeli National Youth Orchestra, wonderful performer in, in every way. Yes, I did love White Christmas, but amongst his other, and uh, quite an incredible human being. And there they are. So in 1970, the province of Manitoba purchased this building and extensively renovated it. Uh, the, main audit, the main auditorium was converted, of course, um, into vault space, the exhibition galleries into reference rooms, home now to the archives, the legislative library, and elections Manitoba. And this is the opening. And I do have a connection to the last talk that I heard on the Royal Alec, because between the two upper floors of the building, there is one of the Challoner murals, one of the remaining ones from the Royal Alec Hotel that we last talk about, talked about. And it's hanging, you have to ask to see it and gain permission. Um, 14 by 14 feet, and it's an absolutely beautiful building, and it also ties into the Fort Gary Gate, of course, that we still have. And if you get the chance and have the time, do try and see it. So, what now? The auditorium has been successfully reconverted to the archives. The bay, we don't know, and as I said, um, Heritage Winnipeg has a subcommittee that is looking into it. And if you're interested, I have some brochures on Heritage Winnipeg. <laughs> but thank you very much for attending this. I will see you again. I wanted to thank Susan for coming out today. It's always such a pleasure, Susan, to have your, <laughs> have your, uh, have your thoughts and your perspectives on uh, what Winnipeg was like and where we are right now. So thank you very much for coming out. There's more coffee, tea, cookies at the back, and come join us again at other Music and Maidens events. Thank you.